The Singapore Launch in November 2014 as a not-for-profit organization dedicated to promoting the use of mediation in cross-border disputes. It was tough going at first. In the first year, only a handful of cases were referred to us, but we persevered. And today, I'm happy to report that we are getting close to two cases a week referred to us for mediation, a number of which have no links to Singapore. Last year, we supported the mediation of a large energy dispute involving parties from five countries. And just two months ago, we received our first investor state dispute involving an investor and an Asian government. So the signs are encouraging, and we attribute this to the quality of the international mediators on our panel, the institutional support that SIMC gives to parties in the course of the mediation, and the increasing use of mediation globally. In the past six years or so, SIMC has worked closely with our partners in India, Japan, South Korea, China, and other countries to promote the use of mediation in cross-border disputes. In India, we have been fortunate to work with our friends at CAMP and Mediation Mantras to train senior practitioners and ex-judges to conduct international mediations. It's quite different. And now we are taking a giant step forward in our journey together by organizing this momentous mediation summit. In conjunction with the summit, SIMC and our partners CAMP and Mediation Mantras are embarking on several new and exciting initiatives. These initiatives include, one, a new cross-border mediation service for businesses operating along the busy India-Singapore trade corridor during the COVID-19 pandemic. Two, a declaration to encourage business chambers and companies to consider mediation first before embarking on an adversarial process. And three, training senior practitioners in international mediation. We also welcome working with other collaborators in India to promote cross-border mediation in the coming days. But today, we have the privilege of having two great legal luminaries share with us their thoughts on mediation. His Honour Chief Justice Ramana, who is well known for his views on access to justice, and His Honour Chief Justice Menon, who has been the architect of so many of our judicial, judicial reforms in Singapore. Your Honours, thank you for being part of this summit. We are also fortunate to have Minister Edwin Tong and Mr Amitabh Khan to share their views on how governments can support and promote mediation. We will round up today's summit with a panel discussion and our panellists have been given free licence to be provocative if need be. Allow me to conclude by quoting the great Mahatma Gandhi, the grandfather of mediation in India. Many of you are familiar with this quote, but every time I read it, it strikes a different chord. Gandhiji said, and I quote, I had learned the true practice of law. I had learned to find out the better side of human nature and enter men's hearts. I realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties driven asunder. The lesson was so indelibly, indelibly burnt into me that a large part of my time during my 20 years of practice as a lawyer was occupied in bringing about private compromises of hundreds of cases. I lost nothing thereby, not even money. Certainly not my soul. Close quote. I hope the thoughts and ideas shared today 
will leave an indelible mark in your hearts. Thank you, and please stay safe during these challenging times. We look forward to meeting up post-pandemic. Thank you, George. Appreciate the heartfelt quotation from Gandhiji. We would like to welcome our special guest to deliver his remarks, Mr. Edwin Tong, SC, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, and Second Minister for Law. Minister Tong, please. Thank you, Wimeng. Honourable Mr. Justice N.B. Ramana, Chief Justice of India, the Honourable Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon, Chief Justice of Singapore, Honourable Judges, Distinguished Guests, Members of the Bar from India and Singapore and elsewhere, many guests online, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you joining us from India and a good afternoon to the rest of us in Singapore. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm delighted to be here today to give some opening remarks at the inaugural India-Singapore Mediation Summit, ISMS. In more usual times, we could perhaps be having this summit in India, and indeed, that's what we had planned to do. We could be meeting in person, not just exchange views, but also catch up with old friends. Unfortunately, we are still battling COVID-19, and although the situation has improved since May, when we originally planned to hold this summit, the situation throughout, I must say, has been very fluid, and our organizers has had to be equally fluid. So let me start by expressing my appreciation to the organizers, SIMC, Camp Arbitration and Mediation Services, and Mediation Mantras, for adapting to the evolving situation so well, pressing on, and turning this into a virtual event, which has in turn lent to a very strong participation. More than 3,000 have signed up, and indeed I see very many familiar faces on my screen. I last visited India in August 2019, together with Minister Shanmugam, just after the Singapore Convention on Mediation signing ceremony and conference. During that trip, I met a number of judges, lawyers, in-house counsel, and of course, mediators. We had lots to discuss on not just the Singapore mediation and the convention, but also international dispute resolution in general. I recall the strong support amongst Indian businesses and practitioners for the use of mediation as a means to resolve cross-border disputes. The Singapore Convention as a means to enforce the mediated agreements that arise from mediation. As in many parts of Asia, mediation in India dates back many centuries. Respected village elders, known as panchayats, mediated in community disputes. The often quoted story was that of two women claiming to be the mother of a child and how the panchayat identified the mother. I think many of you know the story. Business associations are often also called upon on, for impartial, neutral, and respected businessmen or mahajans to mediate commercial disputes between their members. So the use of mediation to resolve conflicts is certainly not unfamiliar to many. As Indian bis businesses and companies became more and more international and deal with business partners from around the world, it would be natural, perhaps even inevitable and necessary, to extend mediation to international commercial disputes. The economic activities in India are only going to increase. Today, India is the sixth biggest economy in the world. The Center for Economic Business Research pro projects that India will overtake the UK to become the fifth largest by 2025, and will also be in serious contention for the third spot by 2030, so within a 10-year horizon. If you take a look at our two countries, Singapore and India, trade and investment between Singapore and India are also on the rise. Today, Singapore is the biggest contributor to FDI. Inflows into India from April 2020 to March 2021, a figure which has continued to grow even from the preceding pre-COVID period of 2019 to 2020. And Indian companies today form the largest overseas contingent that have invested in Singapore. There is therefore impetus for us to collaborate more closely on mediation for several reasons. It's a mediation, it's a dispute resolution mechanism that has been historically practiced by both our societies. Both our economies, our judiciary are very comfortable with it. It's a known quantity. And more importantly, 
It is a means of resolving disputes in a manner which gives parties the best chance of maintaining what could very often be hard-won, long-standing commercial relationships. Our companies are very familiar with it, as I said, and many welcome it. It's generally faster, more cost-effective, and as I said, helps to preserve business relationships. It is especially imperative during this period when more disputes may arise to disruptions in supply chains and, of course, various other unanticipated restrictions. Businesses may also be on tighter budgets. Many have been. The pandemic will pass someday, and they would want these business relations that they have maintained, built up over the years, to remain harmonious. In mediation, what's most vital is having a mediator who understands not just the disputes, but the parties, not just the industry they operate in, but also the cultural nuances, particularly for cross-border mediations, and the little details which often can be unarticulated. Therefore, when we set up SIMC in 2014, we insisted on having the best mediators from around the world, not just from Singapore. We are agnostic as to where they come from, as long as they can be the best in mediation. This is so that parties will be able to have access to first-class mediators who would be able to meet their requirements and their counterparts' requirements. Today, SIMSP, I'm happy to say, has an international panel of over 70 mediators from 17 jurisdictions with expertise in a variety of areas, including six from India. This is also supplemented by specialist mediators from key jurisdictions. And I recall that when I was in India in August 2019, we have paneled 21 such specialist mediators from India. This will be further enhanced after SIMC and Camp Arbitration and Mediation Services sign an MOU to collaborate on a joint COVID-19 protocol. Under this protocol, which I think is really much needed, one co-mediator is selected from SIMC's panel of mediators and another co-mediator from Camp's panel of mediators who are familiar with each, other, each, each country's different legal regimes and also different cultural contexts. The filing fee will be reduced as we recognize that businesses are already facing tremendous financial difficulty and pressure because of COVID-19. Mediation will be conducted online or perhaps in a hybrid form to overcome the current limitations on travel. SIMC has successfully managed the mediation of the first case under the joint COVID-19 protocol with the Japan International Mediation Center, JIMC. That case involved a complex, high-value dispute between an Indian entity and a Japanese entity over a joint venture agreement. The parties had commenced arbitration, but thankfully wanted to uh, start and try mediation first. SIMC and JIMC each appointed a co-mediator who was familiar with Japan and India respectively, and they helped the parties to build strong cross-cultural understanding and also foster rapport, the two ingredients which are really very important at the start of a mediation, and they did so with the center's end-to-end -end support. By the second day of mediation, the parties had agreed in principle to settle the dispute, and this took place within seven weeks of the suspension of arbitration. Having the dispute to be resolved in a matter of weeks and in a non-contentious manner has undoubtedly saved a lot of time and resources, and of course, I would hope preserve the commercial relationship as well. I'm very confident that a protocol between SIMC and CAMP will similarly benefit dispute resolution users in Singapore and India. Whilst getting a mediated settlement agreement is a good first step, there will always be a niggling worry, especially when you deal with a cross-border party, that the other party may not fulfill their part of the bargain. So what's important in the mediation is the assurance that any agreement that parties reached will be complied with. The Singapore Convention on Mediation, which facilitates the enforcement of mediated settlements of an international commercial dispute, offers this assurance. So far, 54 countries have signed the convention, and six countries have gone on to ratify the convention. India was one of the first countries to sign the convention, and we look forward to India's ratification soon, and we'll be happy to share Singapore's experience in this regard, if necessary. Singapore will also be organizing the Singapore Convention Week and the Ancestral Academy events from the 6th to the 10th of September 2021, later this year, where thought leaders from around the world will share their expertise and experience on mediation and also other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. I invite all of you 
to participate in the events which will be streamed online. Before I end, let me thank once again SIMC, Camp Arbitration and Mediation Practice and Mediation Mantra once again for the tremendous effort for putting all of this together and for inviting me to this platform. I hope that one day we'll be able to travel again soon so that we can really catch up with old friends and also make new ones. I think we have two tremendous speakers coming up. I'm looking forward to listening to them and I wish all of you a very fruitful summit ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I do recall the trip to India with much fondness, meeting up with leading mediators and practitioners in India. We are very honoured to have the Chief Justice of India and the Chief Justice of Singapore to grace this occasion as joint guests of honour. This is thought to be the first time that the heads of the judiciary of both countries are joint guests of honour for an event, making this really a milestone occasion. Honourable Justice, uh, Honourable Mr. Justice Ramana, Chief Justice of India, and the Honourable the Chief Justice Sunraj Menon, Chief Justice of Singapore, will be delivering keynote addresses in today's summit. I'd like to first welcome Chief Justice Ramana to deliver his keynote address. Chief Justice Ramana, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hunt. The Honourable Chief Justice of Singapore, Mr. Justice Sundaresh Meenan, Mr. Edward Fong, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, and Second Minister for Law Singapore, Mr. Justice A.K. Sikri, former Judge Supreme Court of India, Mr. Amitabh Khan, Chief Executive Officer Neeti Ayod, Mr. George Lim, Chairman of Singapore International Mediation Center, Honorable judges sitting and retired from India, Singapore, and other countries, distinguished members of the bar from across the world, media persons, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. Let me start by expressing my gratitude to everyone involved in organizing today's event. A seemingly impossible task has been made possible to everyone's hard work and support. To this end, let me appreciate and congratulate everyone at the Singapore International Media Center, CAMP, Mediation Mantras, and the officers of the Supreme Court of Singapore and the Supreme Court of India. I am extremely pleased to share this platform with Honorable Justice Sundaresh Meena, the very eminent Chief Justice of Singapore. His kindness and generosity of spirit were apparent during my earlier interaction with him. I would also like to thank my dear brother, Justice Sikri, who has been a constant source of support and help throughout his process. His guidance throughout my time in the Supreme Court has been invaluable. I am delighted to be speaking at this event as over the past 18 months, we have not been able to interact due to the pandemic. Meeting all of you, even online, gives me immense pleasure. Conflicts are unavoidable in any society for a variety of reasons, political, economic, social, culture, and religious. And with conflicts, there is also the need to develop mechanisms for conflict resolution. India and numerous Asian countries have a long and rich tradition of collaborative and amicable settlement disputes. The great Indian epic, the Mahabharata, actually provides an example of any early attempt at mediation as a conflict resolution tool, where Lord Krishna attempted to mediate the dispute between the Pandavas and Kauravas. It may be worthwhile to recall that the failure of mediation led to disastrous consequences. Mediation as a concept is deeply embedded into the Indian ethos. Long before the arrival of the British adversarial system in India, 
various forms of mediation were being practiced as a method of dispute resolution. Disputes were often resolved by the chieftains or elders of the community. Similarly, disputes relating to business were resolved by merchants, either by direct negotiation or through merchant bodies. However, the establishment of the British court system in 1775 marked the erosion of community-based indigenous dispute resolution mechanisms in India. The British judicial system has ultimately become the framework with appropriate modifications for the current judicial system in India. A funny anecdote captures the attitude of the judges in this adversarial system. When a judge sipping his early morning coffee, flipping through the newspapers, his granddaughter approached him and said, Grandpa, my older sister has taken away my toy. The judge's immediate response is, do you have any evidence? The Indian judicial system is unique to not only because of a written constitution, but also because of the immense faith reposed by the people in the system. People are confident that they will get relief and justice from the judiciary. It gives them the strength to pursue the dispute. They know that when things go wrong, the judiciary will stand by them. The Indian Supreme Court is the guardian of the largest democracy. The constitution gives wide-ranging powers and jurisdiction to do complete justice between the parties to bring to life the motto of the Indian Supreme Court, Keto Dharma Tato Jaya, that is, where there is Dharma, there is victory. Having said that, I think there are a few contributing factors that have revived the alternative dispute resolution mechanism in India. The first it relates to judicial delays. The often quoted statistics that in pendency in Indian courts has reached 45 million cases, which is perceived as the inability of the Indian judiciary to cope up with the case load. This is an overstatement and an uncharitable analysis. The term pendency you use it to refer to all cases which have not yet been disposed of without any reference to how long the case has been spent in the judicial system. This would mean that the case which was filed yesterday gets added to the pendency statistic. This is therefore not a useful indicator of how well or poorly a system is doing. Rather, it is important to reduce errors and backlogs in the system. Errors refers to delays that are unwarranted. Every delay is not an error. Some cases of delay might be due to valid reasons. On the other hand, backlogs refers to a situation where the number of cases instituted in a period is more than the number of cases disposed of in the same period. There is no doubt that the issues of judicial delays is a complex problem, not just in India. Several factors contribute towards such a situation. One of them is an Indian phenomena called luxurious litigation. It is a specific type of litigation wherein parties with resources attempt to frustrate the judicial process and delays by filing numerous proceedings across the judicial system. Undeniably, the prevailing pandemic COVID has also contributed to our woes. The sheer number of cases in the Indian judicial system may have to be viewed in the context that India is the largest democratic republic in the world. The people believe in the constitutional project of which the judiciary is an integral part. The judges in India, particularly in the constitutional courts, often burn the midnight oil to meet their judicial and administrative caseload. The second factor which contributed to the growth of area relates to the increased access to justice in India. 
it can safely be stated that the legal aid programs in India is one of the largest and most robust. Under the Legal Service Authorities Act 1987, the judiciary has been given statutory backing and responsibility in ensuring that greater access to justice. And I can proudly state that it is one of the greatest success stories of modern India. Nearly 70% of the Indian population, particularly the poor, women, children, minority, senior citizens, and the differently abled are eligible for benefits under various schemes run by the Legal Service Authorities. As we enter the Silver Jubilee year of the establishment of the National Legal Service Authority, it is time to rejoice in the remarkable achievements and to further strengthen the legal aid movement in the country. Apart from increasing legal awareness, the National Legal Service Authority encourages the settlement of disputes through ADR. One such mechanism is the Lokadalat, literally people's court. Lokadalats are tasked with the responsibility of settling cases which are reported to, the, to them from courts or by parties themselves. Prayer to initiating litigation is referred. To give you some indication of the scope of the activities, over 7.84 million cases were settled by Lokadalas in 2019 and 2020. Nearly 3.94 million cases were settled at the pre-litigation stage itself. This is despite the pandemic and was possible by building an efficient online dispute resolution system in India. Another important factor that resulted in India shift towards ADR mechanisms relates to the opening of the Indian market, that is the major economic reforms undertaken in 1995. Laws were required to be modified to keep pace with ever-changing society and its needs. There was a need to increase the confidence of investors and business, both domestic and foreign, and allow them more autonomy and control in resolving the disputes arising out of their investment and business plans. After India opened its economy, the parliament enacted the Arbitration and Act 1996 to bring the Indian arbitration regime in the line with the incentral model law. This was probably the most important legal reform, which, was, which has received immense attention by the Indian legal and business community. The law attempts to put a framework in place that allows for maximum party autonomy with the least judicial interference. ADR mechanisms, particularly mediation and conciliation, can reduce pendency, save resources and time, and allow litigants a degree of control over the process and outcome of the dispute resolution process. Designed around a participatory model, mediation and conciliation enable parties to become insiders to a process that traditionally treated them as outsiders. This is the important point. As a result, the focus has shifted to the flexible non adjudicatory dispute resolution process of mediation and conciliation. Mediation and conciliations are interchangeable expressions in many jurisdictions. However, in India, the conciliator has wider powers than a mediator. The conciliator can make a proposal for settlement and can formulate the terms of the settlement. The mediator, on the other hand, only acts as a facilitator for the parts, parties to come to a settlement. Unlike conciliation, which is governed by the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, mediation, mediation is not governed by any specific statute in India. The Industrial Dispute Act 1947 had a provision regarding mediation. More recently, the Commercial Courts Act 2015 and the Real Estate Regulation and Development Act 2016 have provisions relating to compulsory pre-litigation mediation. Amendments have also been made in the Companies Act 2030 and the Consumer Protection Act 2019 that allow for mediation. Most importantly, a provision in India's Civil Procedure Court empowering courts to refer parties to mediation was revived by the Parliament in 1999.
being section 89 of the CPC. However, it was left to the Indian Supreme Court to give life to this section of the code. The absence of any guidelines or rules for the operation of mediation was being sorely felt and was one of the reasons that mediation was not taken up. In a constitutional challenge to section 89 CPC, the Supreme Court of India appointed a committee to draft mediation rules, which were subsequently approved. And all the high courts were directed to frame their rules. This led to the development of co-directed mediation in India. In the celebrated judgment of Afghans International, the Supreme Court of India clarified certain ambiguities which were inherent in the drafting of Section 89 CPC. The section, as its original is to place the cart before the heart. The Supreme Court held that the, the duty of the court to find out the suitability of the area resolutions of a particular dispute and refer the parties to the same. Further, the court facilitated the enforceability of such settlements by requiring them to be made a part of the final decree. Court annexed mediation, along with the mandate to refer matters to ADR mechanisms on the section 89 CPC, can be considered an Indian adoption of the multi door courthouse proposed by Harvard professor Frank Sander. The model suggested by Professor Sander include a center that would contain numerous disputes resolution mechanisms under one roof. A screening would take place and after determination of the nature of the problem, the parties would refer to the appropriate door to resolve their disputes. In the current Indian scenario, the screening provided for under Section 89 CPC takes place within the court. Subsequently, the court may refer the matter to the appropriate ADR mechanisms, including mediation. Such mediation referrals often happen in the Supreme Court of India, and I have personally seen disputes that have subsisted for decades get resolved to the process of mediation within a short time. The Afghan international judgment also highlighted certain types of disputes that it would be profitable for a court to refer to mediation and such other categories of cases where, where mediation might not be appropriate. It may merit mention that most cases being referred to the court annexed mediation related to family or matrimonial disputes. Private mediations which take place at the pre-litigation stage are also becoming more prevalent in the country. Most arbitration causes in the commercial contracts have a multi-tied approach where the first attempt to resolve the disputes between the parties is through mediation or negotiation. At this juncture, it might be worth mentioning that the House of Lords held in 1992 that agreements to have good faith discussion before opting for arbitration or court litigation were not binding. On the other hand, India and Singapore are among the two jurisdictions to have taken a different path and made such agreements enforceable. Apart from enriching and clarifying the law as to mediation, the Supreme Court of India also made an active effort on the administrative side to improve the mediation landscape in India. The Supreme Court Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee was set up in 2005 by the then Chief Justice of India. Some of the committee's most important activities related to the training of mediators referral judges throughout the country, along with the publication of training manuals. A development in 2019, which bears special mention relates to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. This is intended to create a framework for cross-border enforcement of international settlement agreements, mark a few step forward. The convention is important for creating trust and faith with respect to international commercial settlement agreements. India was one of the first signatories of the Singapore Convention in 2019. This brings to me to the current state of mediation in India. There are nearly 40,000 mediation centers in India. The data suggests that since 2005, nearly 3.22 million cases have been referred and nearly 1 million cases have been settled by mediation up to March 2021. 
Despite the encouraging figures, certain barriers persist with respect to the adoption of mediation in India. Before ensuring the success of mediation in, India, in the country, it is necessary to address issues of legitimacy, credibility, and acceptability of mediation. I would like to leave you with some concluding thoughts regarding modern mediation practices that I believe merit highlighting and deserve discussion. The first relates to the role of a mediator in the dispute resolution process. Traditionally, mediation was thought of as a facilitating process. The mediator played the passive and limited role of improving communication between the parties. He only needed to ensure that parties understood the underlying issues and enabled them to reach a beneficial resolution to their dispute. They therefore acted only as a guide, leading the parties to the best solution. However, with more complex and sophisticated problems now being referred to mediation, particularly in the commercial arena, the role of mediators is changing to include both evaluative and adversary participation. The mediator is now being asked to provide more active assistance to the parties to reach a settlement. He is expected to assess the relative strengths and weaknesses of each party and suggest solutions based on the same. When the role becomes adversary, advisory, there is an inherent risk of the mediator losing neutrality, opening up the door for temptations and extraneous considerations. The second issue relates to the extent of neutrality and aloofness of a mediator. A mediator must possess during the possess during the process. You can call these problems the mediator's moral dilemma. The theory of mediation contemplates two parties who are equal in bargaining capacity seeking the assistance of mediator to resolve their disputes. But what happens when one party is better situated economically, socially, and politically than the other? What is the duty of a mediator if the settlement reached is patently unjust to the weaker party? Should the mediator be a silent spectator during such negotiations? Is the mediator merely concerned with enabling the parties to arrive at a settlement and not concern the terms of the settlement. These are just some of the questions which one must consider. Particularly in a country like India, our diverse social fabric, the requirement of substantial equality are a bedrock of every constitutional democracy. And these ideals must be reflected even during the dispute resolution process. Let me clarify that my intention in flagging of these concerns is not, a, not to discourage mediation, but to make it a more robust process. My object is to initiate a debate and discussion in regard to the nature and the limitations of the role of a mediator, so that it can be clearly and carefully calibrated. Rather, the mediator must be equipped to understand the situation of the parties before him and to choose the appropriate approach. This can only be made possible with carefully designed, in-depth and continuous training of mediators. I believe that it may be beneficial to take a leaf of the book of the aviation industry. Commercial pilots are mandated to train every year. Such training usually contains a simulator component where pilots are given multiple scenarios to which they must safely land the plane in a flight in the plane in a flight simulator software. Mediators training programs should contain such a component, and the development of a game-like software for mediators might be a useful innovation to have in place. This is also brings to another important factor, the need of ethical standards on impeachable integrity and neutrality of the mediators. As I mentioned earlier, 
a more active involvement of the mediator in the process of mediation could open the doors to parties attempting to influence the court. This necessitates the creation of an environment which prevents any such attempts being made by any unscrupulous party. It requires that mediators be of good character and moral standing. For this, it is necessary that rules and regulations governing mediators are updated and implemented to ensure transparency and neutrality. The point that I have highlighted are only illustrative, and any solutions suggested are rudimentary at best. I am hopeful that the present summit will foster a dialogue from which solutions may emerge. I am looking forward to the conclusions that emerge from the interactions between practitioners in the Singapore and India. Given the growing scope of mediation, it is time for India to enter mission mode. To popularize mediation at cheaper and faster dispute resolution mechanism, a movement needs to be launched, prescribing mediation as a mandatory first step for resolution of every allowable dispute, which will go a long way in promoting mediation. Perhaps an omnibus law in this regard is needed to fill the vacuum. We must take note of that fact that a vast majority of litigants in India belongs to middle and poorer sections of society. They will find great solace if mediation gets established as a reliable means of redress. Needless to state, it will lead to a remarkable reduction in the number of cases reaching the regular course. Such a scenario will enhance the efficiency of the judicial system. India, the world's largest democracy, is home to many identities, religions, and cultures, which contribute to its unity through diversity. This is where the rule of law with assured a sense of justice and fairness come into play. Mediation being the cheapest and simplest option available to the public at large can be described as a tool of social justice in the Indian context. Such a party-friendly mechanism ultimately affords the rule of law by providing an incentive for parties to utilize their autonomy to the fullest to arrive at a just and equal equitable outcome. Several states in India are currently coming to build a robust and area friendly environment. Recently, the state of Telangana has come forward to set up a state of art ADR facility. This is a welcome move and I hope other states will soon follow. Cooperation between India and Singapore is going to be a significant factor in promoting alternative dispute redressal mechanisms in both our countries as well as in the entire subcontinent. I would like to conclude with the words of Abraham Lincoln. I quote, discourage litigation, pursue your neighbor to compromise whenever you can. As a peacemaker, the liars has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Namaskar. Thank you, Chief Justice Ramana, for your insightful keynote address. And amongst other themes, it's time for India to enter mission mode. Now, I would like to invite Chief Justice Sunuresh Menon to share his keynote address on setting the stage for mediation's golden age. Chief Justice Menon, please. Thank you so much, uh, We Ming. The Honorable Mr. Justice N.B. Ramana, Chief Justice of India, Mr. Edwin Tong, Senior Counsel, Minister for Communi Culture, Community and Youth, and Second Minister for Law, Singapore. Mr. Amitabh Khant, Chief Executive of Niti Aayog. Mr. George Lim, Senior Counsel, Chairman of the Singapore International Mediation Center. Honorable Judges, Distinguished Members of the Bar from India, Singapore, and elsewhere members of the mediation community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good day to all participants. It is my privilege to deliver this keynote address for today's summit alongside the Honorable Chief Justice Ramana. Before I begin, let me first extend my heartiest congratulations to Chief Justice Ramana on his recent appointment as the 48th Chief Justice of India. This is a signal achievement as well as a tremendous responsibility 
and we all wish you the very best. As your Lordship has mentioned, it was a real pleasure to have a substantive online meeting with you some weeks ago, and I look forward to working together on a number of the initiatives between our courts that we discussed. Let me also, like Chief Justice Ramana, acknowledge the efforts of our mutual friend and colleague, Justice A.K. Sikri, in promoting the excellent relations between the legal establishments of India and Singapore. And one sign of that relationship can be seen in the fact that less than two weeks ago, I had the immense pleasure of presiding at a hearing of the Court of Appeal in Singapore from a decision of the Singapore International Commercial Court, where Justice Sikri shared the bench with me and three other judicial colleagues. The theme for today's event is international commercial mediation, and in particular, making it mainstream. As a means of resolving disputes, mediation has a long and storied history, perhaps especially in Asia. While arbitration has taken the spotlight for some time, owing in large part to the adoption of the New York Convention more than six decades ago, in 1958. In recent years, mediation has come to experience real growth as a key mechanism for the resolution of cross-border commercial disputes. This trend bears particular significance for all of us here, because a robust and trustworthy system of dispute resolution is integral to the strong ties in trade and commerce that exist between our jurisdictions. Investors and businesses need this confidence as they venture afield. And so I propose to use my time to share with you some reflections on the rapid march of mediation into the mainstream of dispute resolution, its immense potential for Asia, and the role that our jurisdictions may play in this development. Let me begin by outlining Singapore's journey and experience with mediation, which I suggest can best be understood in three main arcs. The first begins in the 1990s, when we made a deliberate decision to revive what was then the somewhat fading practice of mediation. Mediation, of course, is not a new phenomenon. Historically, India and Singapore share a tradition of village elders and respected community leaders resolving disputes through informal mediation. In India, for instance, as Minister Tong mentioned in his opening speech, this was among the responsibilities vested in the village panchayat boards. In post-independent Singapore, as the country underwent rapid urbanization, this simple and effective method of dispute resolution gradually gave way to formal court litigation. The concerted move to revive the practice of mediation was driven by perhaps four main objectives. First, to check the growing trend of litigiousness that was taking hold in our society. Second, to provide a more economical and less adversarial way to resolve conflicts and in this way to enhance access to justice. Third, to ease the judicial caseload. And fourth, to promote recourse to amicable and harmonious means of dispute resolution, which we saw as being consistent with our culture and our values. These objectives rested on the growing recognition of the unique value and benefits that mediation promises. By now, these are familiar to most of us. Foremost among them is the fact that the parties can resolve their disputes through a tailored process in a flexible yet confidential manner, while also having to expend less time and money when compared to other more formal modes of dispute resolution. 
as Chief Justice Ramana observed, it features the unique and considerable advantage of bringing to the inside of the process those who have traditionally been outsiders despite having the most to lose. It is also highly effective. More than 70% of mediated disputes are settled, often within a day. And this is so even for the more complex cross-border commercial cases. Even in situations where settlement might prove elusive, the parties having undergone mediation are clearer as to the issues and interests at stake, and so are better able to tailor and streamline subsequent processes to manage the outstanding issues in the best way possible. Importantly, mediation being non-adversarial and interest-based can help preserve a functional relationship between disputing parties. In jurisdictions such as ours, where a premium is placed on harmony, trust, and good relationships, mediation's ability to enable the parties to manage and resolve their differences without taking adversarial and overly hostile positions that result in zero-sum win-loss outcomes cannot be understated. We therefore took steps in the 1990s to establish a formal structure for mediation within the domestic legal landscape. In 1994, alternative dispute resolution was officially introduced in what was then referred to as the subordinate courts and now known as the state courts to promote and facilitate non-adversarial methods of dispute resolution. In 1997, we established the Singapore Mediation Center that focused on dealing with commercial disputes and with promoting the use of mediation outside of the court system. And from 1998, we took this a step further by establishing in locations throughout the country community mediation centers designed to provide an accessible, affordable and effective means of resolving community disputes. Drawing lessons from the past, mediators at these community centers were community volunteers, and most of them were leaders of community and grassroots organizations. These concerted and sustained efforts have contributed significantly to the successful revival of mediation within the domestic legal landscape. In the process, we have come to appreciate once again the features and value of mediation and have developed a core of professionals familiar with its use. Today, mediation is facilitated and encouraged at all levels of the court system and in respect of a wide range of matters, whether involving commercial interests or those of the community. Between 2012 and 2017, some 6,700 cases were mediated annually at the state courts, with a settlement rate in excess of 85%. Working in tandem with the Singapore Mediation Center, cases in the Supreme Court are also regularly assessed for their suitability for referral to mediation. Our domestic experience paved the way for the second arc of our journey, which has been defined by the growth and internationalization of our mediation services and institutions. The genesis of this is a high-level working group that was formed in 2013 to recommend ways to develop Singapore as a center for international commercial mediation. The working group, which comprised local and international luminaries in the field, observed that with the exponential growth in trade and investment across Asia, 
demand for dispute resolution services that were attuned to and able to cope with the growing complexity of cross-border commercial disputes would inevitably also rise. Two key reforms were implemented pursuant to the recommendations of the working group. First, in 2014, we established the Singapore International Mediation Center as a private nonprofit organization with the specific objective of providing world-class international commercial mediation services. Although the SIMC is still a relatively young institution, it has to date received more than 170 mediation filings involving parties from nearly 40 jurisdictions with a total dispute value exceeding 4.4 billion US dollars. Second, we introduced the Mediation Act of 2017, which forms the cornerstone of our mediation framework. Apart from clarifying common law rules of confidentiality and admissibility in the context of mediation, and allowing parties to seek a stay of court proceedings pursuant to an agreement to mediate, the Act also provides for, among other things, the enforceability of out-of-court mediated settlements in the same manner as an order of court. This is vital if we are to promote the willingness of parties to engage in the process of mediation and to ensure that they adhere to the terms of any mediated settlement agreement. Our dispute resolution landscape today offers a full suite of options. The Singapore International Commercial Court for cross-border commercial litigation, the Singapore International Arbitration Center for International Arbitration, and the SIMC for mediation. And it is fair to say that mediation has taken its rightful place as a co-equal and complementary process alongside the more entrenched options of litigation and arbitration. What then is the third arc of our mediation journey? In a sense, it is a work in progress. I recall that in September 2019, when addressing an audience in Vietnam, I expressed the belief that in the coming decade, as the global economic order continues to reorient itself towards Asia, we would see the dawning of a new golden age of international commercial mediation. Taking in the developments that have occurred in the short period that has passed since then, if anything, I suspect this might happen even sooner. In particular, there are two drivers that provide fuel and momentum as we embark on the third arc. First, the Singapore Convention on Mediation, and second, and perhaps surprisingly, the COVID-19 pandemic. The Mediation Convention is poised to radically alter the future of mediation, not just in Singapore, but globally. Minister Edwin Tong spoke about this earlier in his address. The most important contribution of the Mediation Convention is the confidence it provides that international commercial mediation can result in binding and internationally enforceable outcomes. In so doing, it alleviates a key concern that has long acted as a drag on the growth of mediation as compared to other adjudicative mechanisms, namely the perception that mediated outcomes are in the end simply fresh agreements that are just as viable as the agreements that gave rise to the disputes in the first place. In the international survey conducted by the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy and published last year, enforceability was identified as the top factor 
influencing the respondent's choice of dispute resolution mechanisms. The survey found that while users valued mediation for conferring speed and cost advantages over other modes of dispute resolution, it lost its edge when it came to enforceability. With the mediation convention in place, users can now have the best of both worlds, speed and cost savings with widespread enforceability. This is a compelling proposition for businesses seeking to lower the legal risks of their international ventures and investments, while also containing their expenditure. The 54 countries that have signed the mediation convention so far already include some of the largest economies in the world, the United States, China, and India, among others. Just last month, Brazil joined their ranks as the latest signatory to the convention. Six of these, including Singapore, have ratified or approved the convention. There will naturally be a gestation period for any international convention as significant as this. But I am confident that with time, the mediation convention will become as influential and as widely accepted as the New York Convention, which governs the enforcement of arbitral awards in more than 160 countries. Indeed, the mediation convention has already sparked renewed discussions on the role that mediation might play in other areas of dispute resolution including investor state dis dispute settlement. The International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, or ICSID, for instance, is working on institutional mediation rules tailored for investment disputes, and in March this year entered into a memorandum with the SIMC to explore further collaboration in this area. I suggest that the other key driver that will fuel the growth of mediation is the COVID-19 pandemic. Just months after the mediation convention opened for signing, the world became gripped in the throes of the pandemic, which has caused unprecedented disruptions to all aspects of life and commerce. Entire industries have been left grappling with the uncertainties arising from disrupted supply chains, delayed payments, and operational difficulties. For many caught in this situation, it makes little commercial sense to seek a vindication of their legal rights as though nothing had changed. Formal and adversarial means of dispute resolution almost always entail the expenditure of higher legal costs and time, while also carrying the risk of alienating the very same long-term business relationships that are going to be critical for business recovery. And even if one prevails in such proceedings, there is no guarantee in these times that the losing party will be able to pay any damages that might have been awarded. In these circumstances, mediation offers considerable advantages as a means of helping businesses steer their way through the uncertainties brought about by the pandemic. We have therefore made a concerted effort to encourage even greater reliance on mediation during this period. For domestic matters, for example, the Supreme Court worked with the Singapore Mediation Center to launch the SG United Mediation Initiative. The scheme provided for the referral of suitable cases in the Supreme Court to the SMC for mediation with the party's consent and at no charge. Not only did this assist many of the parties to settle their disputes quickly and amicably and focus on the more urgent priority of running their businesses, 
It also helped the courts manage the backlog of matters that had arisen in the wake of the lockdowns brought about because of the pandemic. In all, mediation was conducted under the scheme for more than 100 cases, of which around 40% were successfully mediated. And this resulted in substantial savings of trial days that would otherwise have been taken up in the High Court. For international matters, the SIMC also introduced the COVID-19 protocol in May 2020. Under the protocol, mediations could be organized within 10 days and conducted at reduced fees. The protocol also lays down procedures for online mediation in response to the travel restrictions imposed across nearly all major jurisdictions. Further, the protocol provides that outcomes will be enforceable either as court orders under the Mediation Act or the Mediation Convention in countries that have ratified or approved the treaty. The protocol has been well received internationally and remains in force to date. If the Mediation Convention helped to raise awareness of and confidence in mediation, the COVID-19 pandemic has catalyzed a greater willingness to undertake mediation and in this process to discover its real value as an efficient, effective and enforceable mechanism for dispute resolution. I understand, for instance, that compared to 2019, the SIMC's caseload in 2020 nearly doubled, and its caseload for the first half of 2021 is already almost that of the whole of last year. This, I suggest, is a clear sign that mediation is fast gaining momentum, especially in the resolution of international commercial disputes. When one considers the other factors at play, including the rise of Asian corporates, our cultural affinity for mediation, and a growing appreciation for the inherent value of dispute prevention and containment, it seems reasonable to suggest that we stand today indeed at the cusp of mediation's golden age. As we look ahead to the future of mediation, we should remind ourselves that legal services, as with all other services, must ultimately be designed with the user at the heart. And for international mediation to come into its own, it must meet the evolving needs of cross-border businesses. I suggest in this light that two trends will likely shape the future of mediation. The first is that at least in the near term, the real attraction of mediation will lie in its inherent flexibility and consequently its ability to complement rather than to compete with litigation and arbitration. This too was a point noted by Chief Justice Ramana. While mediation might well come to thrive as a standalone dispute resolution mechanism, especially as the enforcement of mediated outcomes ceases to be a factor with the growing acceptance of the mediation convention, the current state of its reception suggests that its popularity is at its highest when deployed in combination with adjudicative methods. In a recent 2021 international arbitration survey, 59% of the respondents expressed a preference for using arbitration in combination with other forms of ADR, such as mediation to resolve cross-border commercial disputes. This was a very significant increase over the corresponding figure in the 2018 survey at 49% and the 2015 survey at 34%. This clearly suggests a growing demand for holistic and tailored dispute resolution frameworks that are able to operate in an integrated way 
matching the right type of procedures to the right type of disputes. Such a preference has implications for the way we design our legal systems and processes. And this is reflected in the offerings of our dispute resolution institutions in Singapore. In the SICC, for instance, the practice directions provide, among other things, that counsel should take instructions prior to the first case management conference on their client's intention and willingness to proceed with mediation or any other form of ADR, and that if they are agreeable to mediate, the judge may give directions pertaining to the timelines for and the conduct of the mediation. Where the parties are not prepared to mediate, the judge may direct that the issue be reconsidered at a later stage. Similarly, the ARB-MED-ARB protocol that was developed by the SIAC and the SIMC has been gaining popularity. Under the protocol, once the notice of arbitration has been filed, proceedings are immediately stayed to enable the parties to engage in mediation within an eight-week time frame. Further provisions ensure that the parties can shuttle easily between mediation and arbitration or litigation at any stage and in any order. The central goal is to ensure that the parties have the best option or mix of options suited for the resolution of their particular dispute. The second trend we can anticipate perhaps in the longer term is the greater integration of mediation into our legal systems as a means of serving the rule of law. While mediation is largely an out of court process, I respectfully suggest it is a misconception to suggest that mediation hurts the rule of law by taking the law out of the hands of the court. Rather, the rule of law requires that there be effective access to justice, and this can take place outside the confines of a courtroom. By enhancing the prospect of achieving final and acceptable outcomes when disputes arise, and by providing an often more timely and more cost-efficient alternative to the other methods of dispute resolution, Mediation provides a real and vital option in helping to address legal needs that might otherwise go unmet. We can see this in our experience with the use of mediation during the pandemic, as it offered the parties a more conciliatory and expeditious option for dispute resolution that was better suited to their priority priorities in a challenging period and at less cost. Indeed, in the aftermath of the pandemic, there is value in considering the formalization and expansion of some of these mediation programs that will help us manage and alleviate the court's caseload. Furthermore, and importantly, a point, I want to come to a point that was alluded to by Mr. George Lim in his opening remarks. Mediation uniquely holds the potential to transform society's notions of justice from an adversarial, hierarchical, and formal process geared towards zero-sum outcomes to one that is more consensual, flexible, and interest-based and thus more open to outcomes that focus on the parties moving forward constructively. For many types of disputes, including corporate restructuring, family and community disputes, and the significant number of complex commercial disputes that have an underlying relational element, Mediation offers a particularly effective and, I dare say, compelling mechanism for the parties to resolve their conflicts on their own terms in a manner that prevents the future deterioration of fractured relationships 
and where the costs imposed by the process are amply justified in relation to its benefits. The point in the final analysis is that access to justice entails a fair resolution of the dispute, and this need not come only through an, adju through an adjudicative process. I want to close by speaking very briefly about the role that India and Singapore could play in encouraging the revival and growth of mediation. As most of us will be familiar, the India-Singapore Economic Corridor is fast growing and an extremely important one in Asia and the world. Minister Edwin Tong had earlier shared some statistics on the size and growth in foreign direct investment between our two countries. Bilateral trade in goods and services has also grown by over 80% from 20 billion in 2005 to 38 billion in 2019. I'm using Singapore dollars uh, as the currency. Our strong economic relations and our shared affinity for conciliatory methods of dispute resolution suggest that we could be a test bed for innovation in this field and collaboratively work to promote mediation as part of a more modern dispute resolution system that could serve as a model for Asia and the world. Chief Justice Ramana posed a number of difficult and thought-provoking questions towards the end of his address, if I may say so, his excellent address. And this could be an area that professionals from both our jurisdictions could come together to study and to consider responses to. India evidently shares our interest in mediation as a critically important process of dispute resolution and has in recent years introduced various initiatives to promote its use in a cross-border commercial context, including through the signing of the Mediation Convention. The SIMC and its strategic partners in India have also been working with various stakeholders on projects intended to take cross-border mediation in India and in Singapore to the next level. As we stand at the cusp of mediation's golden age, broader and deeper collaboration between our countries in this area will best position our people, our legal professionals, and our businesses to benefit from its rise in this new era. Finally, let me extend my heartfelt appreciation to the organizers of the summit who have had to manage the event despite the uncertainties and challenges posed by the pandemic. The success of today's event stands as a testament to their dedication and hard work over the past months. Thank you all very, very much, and I wish you and your families safety and good health in these challenging times. Namaste. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Menon, for painting the three arcs and framing your vision of mediation in this golden age. We'd now like to welcome Mr. Amitabh Khan, CEO of Niti Ayok, to provide his felicitations. Mr. Khan, please. Honorable Justice uh, N.V. Ramana, the Chief Justice of India. Honorable Justice Sundaresh Menon, Chief Justice of Singapore. Mr. Edwin Tong SC, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth and Second Minister for Law, Singapore. Mr. George Lim SC, Chairman SIMC. Distinguished Justice A.K. Sikri, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored and delighted to be addressing this August gathering today. I am privileged to be speaking after the remarkably insightful, thought-provoking, thought and extremely progressive addresses by both the Honorable Chief Justices. Mediation is an immensely important dispute avoidance mechanism 
and one which is gaining prominence and priority in the Indian context. In India, the judiciary has led the roadway to equitable justice through the e-courts mission mode project, whose impact percolates both vertically and laterally. The pandemic has necessitated adjustments that are adaptive and innovative, including those in the dispute resolution ecosystem. It now falls upon institutions to determine how equitable distribution can be achieved even in the realm of justice delivery. Each arm of the Indian system must and is working towards a solution-driven future and that is where the change will be visible. The pandemic has forced a shift towards solutions that minimize contact and can be activated through technology, including for resolution of disputes. At the National Institution of Transforming India, Niti Aayog, we have worked extensively on measures that can help enhance efficiency and accessibility to justice for the common man. In this context, Niti Ayo has led the way in formulating a policy action plan for online dispute resolution or ODR. ODR is a fast evolving dispute resolution mechanism that uses technology, not just to aid, but to proactively assess efficient and affordable justice delivery. It can be used as a mechanism for solving disputes outside of the formal court system in an affordable and quick way, especially for small and medium value matters. Due to the pandemic, we will now likely see a deluge of disputes in courts that will require expedient, expedient resolution. And that is why new innovation models such as online dispute resolution including for mediation need explicit support. Niti Aayog established a committee chaired by Justice A.K. Sikri to formulate an action plan for ODR in India. Members of the committee included all the secretaries of the government of India, including the law secretary, justice secretary, and others. While preparing the report, we have conducted approximately 30 stakeholder discussions across diverse specializations and engaged with domestic and international experts and engaged at an institutional and individual level. The policy framework has been universally well received and has received the support of several members of the judiciary as well as all other stakeholders. Our hope is that we put in place an action plan that not only enables ODR in a sustainable framework now, but one that adapts and endures the test of time for it to become an option of first recourse for several categories of claims in a dynamic fashion. A robust ODR ecosystem in India will have high potential to reduce the load on courts by resolving high volume of disputes outside the court and allow gaining access to justice and ease of doing business by making dispute resolution cheaper, quicker, and more importantly, equally credible as conventional methods. The committee had tasked itself with creating a framework for technology-led dispute resolution, which assists the formal court system and lays the groundwork for scalable and adoptable mechanism that stands the test of demand and time requirements. Mediation has been a very integral part of Indian civilization from time immemorial. Gram panchayats have played a very key and significant role in providing mediated settlement from ancient times. It is now well on its way to becoming a major mechanism for dispute resolution due in part to the work of the Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee. It will be incumbent upon all of us to help mediation benefit from major increases in capacity, capability, and training processes. Mediation provides us an opportunity to assist in creating a framework that allows matters to be resolved before entering the formal court system. It can also help reduce pendency and bring justice at an earlier juncture where possible. 
Courts across India have set up court annexed mediation centers, including, but not limited to the Bangalore Mediation Center by the Karnatak High Court and Samadhan by the Delhi High Court. During the pandemic, some courts annexed centers such as Samadhan have in fact led the way in adopting ODR through programs like the online mediation project. It could also be considered to use the precedent of mandatory pre-litigation mediation as has been proposed in the commercial courts pre-institution mediation and settlement rules 2018, which were framed to help resolve matters relating to commercial courts in an efficacious and expeditious manner. Mediation, wherever it has been tried, has gained momentum and is increasingly resorted to and has, been, has seen some impressive success rates. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at an important cusp in India where justice delivery is being looked at carefully and progressively by both the courts and by the government. Mediation is a vital cog to help expedite access to justice at every level of commercial and civil dispute. I congratulate the Singapore International Mediation Center, Camp Arbitration and Mediation Practice and Mediation Mantras for organizing this event. It's Singapore and India that should take the lead and give a huge momentum to mediation across both these nations. I'm delighted that Niti was a part of this extremely important conference, and I'm excited for the potential of mediation in India and both India and Singapore partnering to take this forward. I once again share my gratitude to the Honorable Chief Justices for their insightful and progressive addresses, and I look forward to hearing from the upcoming panel, including Justice Sitri and Mr. Panchu, along with other eminent panelists. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for sharing your hopes and plans on optimizing the use of ODR and mediation during this pandemic period. Our fireside chat will now explore different perspectives on the mediator's role in India and Singapore in a time of COVID-19. The panelists represent leading voices from the public sector, the private sector, along with thought leaders from the legal profession who will share their perspectives. To moderate today's session, we are very happy to have with us Mr. Gregory Vijayendran, Senior Counsel, President of the Law Society of Singapore. I'd like to pass the time to Greg to introduce our panelists and to kick off the fireside chat. Greg, please. Thank you, Wee Ming. Namaste. Greetings to all of you joining us from India, Singapore, and across the globe. It is an honor to moderate today's fireside chat alongside this distinguished panel of speakers who are thought leaders in the business world, public sector, and legal profession. We will be exploring new perspectives on mediation's role in India and Singapore and unpacking the many themes that our speakers earlier on have shared during their insightful speeches. But before we kickstart the session, let's meet our panelists. From India, we have with us today Justice A.K. Sikri, International Judge, Singapore International Commercial Court, and former Judge, Supreme Court of India. Joining him is Mr. Sriram Panchu, Senior Advocate and Mediator, India. And to round up the Indian contingent, we have yeah, Ms. Mayuri Katu, Head of Legal, Tata, Tata International Limited. Over, Over at the at Singapore side, I'm very pleased to have joining us Ms. Lai Wei Lin, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law, Singapore. And to round up our distinguished panelists, we have Mr. George Lim, SP, Chairman, SIMC. And with those round of introductions, let me begin our discussion by putting the first question to our panelists. In the meantime, 
I invite members of the audience to please continue to send in your questions, as some of you already have done, via the Q&A function on Zoom. We will come back to those later, time permitting as many as possible in our Q&A portion. So let's begin first with a reference made by Chief Justice Menon to the benefits of and rationale for mediation, even for cross-border commercial disputes. Chief Justice Menon shared how more than 70% of cases submitted to mediation are settled, often within a day itself. And so we'd like to glean from the experiences of our panelists. What are your experiences with mediation? Could you share success stories or interesting personal anecdotes for the benefit of our audience? Let's begin with Mayuri. Mayuri, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Gregory. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tata International is a diversified conglomerate, mainly into trading of minerals, metals, and agricultural commodities. When we talk about arbitration and mediation, traditionally, our first impression was that commencing an arbitration involves complex formalities, high cost, etc., etc., which is eventually changing now. We at Tata International encourage arbitration preceded by mediation. In fact, in our contracts, we insist for arbitration, and before invoking arbitration, the mediation is sacrosanct. So, in this transition or in journey, even our businesses are happily cooperating since they have also understood the importance of this platform. Our experience is that most of the cases end up in parties settling their disputes, and I feel this platform is a powerful tool to induce that settlement. SIMC model really offers a flexibility and low-cost solutions, along with additional benefits like proximity and understanding cultural diversity, which is very important for Asian countries like ours. From my past experience in commercial legal disputes, it is quite common that whenever a party defaults or is at fault on a particular matter, it simply buries its head into the sand and stops responding to the messages, reminders, etc. And SIMC is handy in this sort of scenarios as there are specific SIMC rules dealing with these issues like deadline for the respondent to respond to claimants and other specific uh, rules expressly providing that if respondent fails to submit the defense, tribunal may nonetheless proceed with the arbitration and pass an award, right? We had this classic case in 2016 where the arbitration was invoked against us, it was pertaining to coal purchase contracts and the claimant was energy and commodity seller based in UAE. We were respondent. We rejected the cargo as there was a dispute, quality of cargo not being as per agreed parameters. There was a discrepancy between the terms agreed during the business confirmation and those appearing in a signed contract that was drafted by the claimant. Let me tell you, the speed at which proceedings were handled was commendable. I mean, we received arbitration invocation notice in December 2016. Parties agreed to mediate, say, in mid of April 2017. And by June 2017, mediated settlement agreement was reached, that which is within six months' time. In my view, this non-adversable and flexible nature of mediation saves time and cost particularly in cross-border cases, which may involve instructing counsels from multiple jurisdictions, as well as complex conflict of law issues. In our experience, we have really found that these mediators are excellent communicators and really highly skilled in variety of negotiation techniques to regulate the dynamics of the conversation. They help provide a sense of objectivity and assist parties to arrive on a common consensus. And therefore, we really highly recommend mediation. Over to you, Gregory. Thank you, Mayuri. Let's hear a Singapore perspective. George, would you like to share? Right. Greg, um, before I begin, let me make a confession. Confession is good for the soul. Right. Um, I was the mediator in the case that Mayuri referred to. Yes. Is that correct, yes. Mayuri? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So she reminded me of the fact, but um, without... <laughs> Divulging confidentiality, um, I think 
you know, by now it was over uh, contract, over the delivery of coal, right? That's right. It was for yeah. coal delivery. And what I remember was that it was it was really good because, you know, there were disputes over the terms of the contract. There was a claim. Um, but at the mediation, the parties were prepared to put that aside and, and look forward. And, and again, without divulging confidentiality, I think in, in the end, the outcome was that they decided to rewrite the, the terms of the contract and to have a fresh contract, right? Yes, 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 yes. absolutely. So it was a win-win for both parties in that, you know, they, they were willing to forget the blame game, all right? There was a misunderstanding, there were, there were differences, but let's look forward commercially to see how we can make this work. And, and the benefit was it, as, as Chief Justice Manning said, preserve the, the business relationship, the long-term business relationship, um, and they saved so much time and cost. Okay. So for me, that was really a, a, a wonderful experience. Thank you, Absolutely. Marie, for remembering that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, George. Yeah. Any other anecdotes that um, any of the other distinguished members of the panel would like to share? Share an anecdote, uh, Gregory? Yes, uh, Sri Ram. You know, uh, we set up India's first port and next mediation center in 2005 in the Madras High Court. And there were one, two, three, four, five cases they didn't succeed. And I was wondering, you know, what's happening? In the sixth case, it was a case of a of a, of, of a contractor who built a house and there were disputes between him and the owner. And it settled in a couple of sessions. The contractor's wife took me aside and said, sir, I have to tell you something. My husband has a life-threatening disease. We need this money desperately. I couldn't say this during the mediation because it would give the other side an advantage. But now that it's over and signed and we have the check, I'm telling you this. And when she left that room, she turned around and she said, sir, there is something I must tell you. This, this is not any ordinary room. This is a house of God. And at that moment, I knew that there is no way, just no way at all, uh, that mediation is not going to work. I knew that its time had come. And looking at what we have today, with the chief justices of both the countries speaking so strongly about the benefits of mediation, I think, you know, in everybody's mind now, there is this way that we have, in fact, I think, we are entering the golden age of mediation. Thank you. And may I also share one or two anecdotes? Yes, please. Uh, Gregory. Actually, as I remember, uh, in the beginning, uh, when in India mediation movement started and we wanted uh, uh, training of mediators where Shiram Panchu had been coming to Delhi High Court for that and had been sharing lots of mediation stories. I think we have so many anecdotes to share, but uh, I'll confine initially to two and uh, quick uh, anecdotes. Uh, one is uh, when I was uh, Chief Justice in Punjab and Haryana High Court, and uh, one application under Section 11 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act was filed for appointment of an arbitrator. And uh, uh, it was a dispute relating to some uh, movie theater in Punjab, and uh, uh, which was a partnership concern, where three brothers and one sister were the partners who were inducted as such by their father. And uh, after marriage, the sister had gone to America. But then the brothers were not giving their share of profits. And then she asked for dissolution of the partnership firm. And it led to, for some time, even the stoppage of the, uh, I mean, this running of that uh, uh, theater as well. And uh, the application was filed for appointment of arbitrator. As Chief Justice in, the, uh, in High Court in Punjab, Haryana, these applications are normally taken by Chief Justice for appointment. And they come on Fridays. When it came before me, I told that lady that uh, she was present in the court. So I told that, look, you have come from America for this uh, particular case. And uh, are you going to stay here for years? She said, no, uh, I have to go back. And I may, I, for time being, I'm going back after one week. So I want my case to be heard today. I said, yes, 
I will hear the case even if your application is allowed. It is only the appointment of an arbitrator. Then the matter will go before the arbitrator, and there may be uh, even the award comes in your favor. Then challenge to that award, etc. All that may take time, and you may have to come back to India time and again. Should I send the matter for mediation and let us see? Because it's a dispute between brothers and sister. And uh, uh, as you are here only for one week, I'll ensure that this mediation starts tomorrow itself on the next day, Saturday. So I appointed one mediator, trained mediator from uh, that court, and uh, sent the matter. And within, uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, kudos to that mediator who started that mediation uh, talks in the morning at 10:30, which went till midnight. But the matter was settled. So, as Chief Justice Sundesh Menon was saying, this is one example where the matter could be settled within uh, one day, and uh, that lady was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, absolved from that harassment of coming uh, time and again, and she went as a good ambassador for India to tell that look, in India, yes, the system is such, it is slow, and uh, the it may take years in so far as cases are to be decided by but by with this mediation process i am able to get my fruits within one day second is a very interesting case where i am again a party and uh, i acted as mediator and uh, what happened in this case was the uh, arbitration clause it was an international dispute and uh, arbitration between multiple parties among two were indian parties and uh, uh, icc paris uh dispute was raised by one of the indian parties where the other indian parties and three foreign parties were also implicated at that time the other parties they came and filed a suit anti suit injunction or saying they said that there is no uh, uh, i mean legally tenable arbitration and that suit was filed in which delhi high court has granted stay of proceedings so but this remained uh, there for years many years ultimately the suit was dismissed and it was said that the arbitration can go on at the stage appeal was filed and in the appeal intra court appeal before the division bench of delhi high court matter was sent to me as mediator now interesting thing which happened was by the time the three uh, foreign companies had uh, quitted and uh, sold their stakes to the other indian company who was the respondent and uh, so therefore many i mean the, the, the uh, uh, attributes of the dispute had uh, gone uh, a change i could settle 80% of that dispute now the question was whether 80% of the uh, things which are settled 20% still remain what should we do so i but i could impress upon them that look 80% settlement you should not uh, the, the entire settlement should not go through only because at 20% because those were legal issues where the parties were taking their positions so they agreed let there be a settlement recorded 80% we file in the high court that this is done and for 20% it was an exceptional thing that we appoint you as an arbitrator and decide that uh, uh, legal issue for us and within one month that 20% dispute i decided by passing an award so it's a it's a very interesting case of arg med arg so initially arbitration but then mediation 80% settled in mediation 20% which could not be settled i settled as an arbitrator so these are some of the fine examples uh, which i can thank you judge for sharing such wonderful uh, anecdotes uh, including that example of the med arg um, that you were personally Uh, presiding uh, over. over. Now, now um, I'll, I'll throw my hand into the ring in terms of um, also sharing, sharing a quick anecdote. anecdote. Minister Tong touched, touched on the India-Japan joint protocol, protocol case, and I was privileged to be a co-mediator in that case, case together with a Japanese, Japanese co-mediator. Uh, that, was that was the first case under the protocol, protocol between, between an Indian company and a Japanese company. company. We, We conducted, conducted it virtually, virtually uh, resolved it ahead of time compared to the number of days that had been scheduled. And in the course of that, navigated language issues and also some of the cultural differences uh, which mayuri touched on as well and um, and we were very pleased that we had a successful outcome and so the future looks bright now let's move on from pros and cons into the business aspects mediation is good for business minister tong shared that trade and investment between india and singapore is on the rise In fact, Indian companies form the largest overseas contingent investing in Singapore, while Singapore is the biggest contributor to FDI inflows into India. 
from April 2020 to March 2021. India is also poised to become the world's third largest economy by 2030. What roles do mediation play in lubricating the wheels of international cross-border commerce, especially in the light of COVID-19? I'd like to open this up to the panel to share your views. Perhaps let's hear from uh, William. Thank you, Greg. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Very happy to see everyone here. Um, I think it's been a really um, exciting account of mediation um, and the growth of mediation over the years. Interesting to hear all the different speakers' perspectives. Um, I think it now, mediation is really poised to take off. You asked about Asia. Um, indeed, I think law really follows business and business opportunities. Once you have trade, once you have investment, you would have contracts, you would need dispute resolution. And mediation is one excellent uh, tool in the toolkit for alternative dispute resolution. And Asia is really poised for growth. Um, it is a hub of a lot of economic activity. I think when we look ahead in the coming decades, many economists would say this is going to be the hub of business activity, hub of economic growth. So it then follows that this is a place, this is an area that we would want to build up mediation and its role um, in cross-border transactions. Um, I think in terms of the pros and cons, I think many of the anecdotes uh, really touch on this already. Um, the pros really, you know, in Singapore, we have this saying of cheaper, better, faster. And I think that sums up uh, mediation in a way, certainly faster, um, can be done in a day, can be done in a week, can be done in weeks, um, certainly faster than other tools in the toolkit. Um, cheaper, I think because once it's shorter, you just incur less cost. Um, and overall, better in terms of outcome because you achieve so much more, uh, not only in the process, being uh, cheaper and quicker, but also just in terms of preserving that relationship between the two parties because it is a uh, win-win outcome for both of them and not the adversarial one. So I think that's how we really see mediation playing a central role going. Thank you, William. Um, any other views uh, to share? Yeah, because uh, I want to add to that. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Shiram, you wanted to go ahead, please. No, after you, after you, after you, sir, after you. Okay. Judge. No, I, I would entirely agree with what you said, and uh, I just wanted to add, and uh, this is highlighted uh, and very emphatically by Chief Justice uh, Menon also, that look, uh, two uh, I mean, uh, factors in last one year, which uh, may be, uh, or last two years, uh, which may now become the wheels for the mediation movements. And uh, uh, one is that Singapore Convention, and other is the COVID. Now, uh, uh, very, in, uh, and if we uh, associated or uh, connected with the other message which he gave, that uh, mediation is flexible, confidential, less time and money consuming and highly effective. Now, this is what the business wants. And that is all the more, it has become important because of the COVID. Because COVID has affected the business across the world. The, there are many economies uh, or many uh, businesses who are now trying to revive. But at the same time, as uh, uh, was said by uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan also, that COVID is going to bring in future a spate of disputes as well because of so many reasons, force major, where the contracts could not be performed and all. So in such scenario, when these kinds of disputes are going to come, I think, the, and everybody knows that many times it is not that because some uh, one or the other party had intentionally breached the contract or could not perform the contract, it was because of COVID conditions. And in such circumstances, going too legalistic by the modes of arbitration or litigation may not be helpful and the best thing in such a, 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 an environment would be mediation where the two parties come together and try to find a solution when they understand that what is going to be uh, 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 the outcome because here they want in immediate and uh, 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 speedy resolution and maintain, maintaining of the relationship also which was highlighted. It's a very interesting uh, quote if I may say so 
that uh, somebody has said, don't believe everything you hear. There are always three sides to a story. Yours, theirs, and the truth. And I feel that in, in litigation and mediation, we take our positions, and it is always you versus I. It is yours and theirs. But the truth comes when mediation takes place, and both parties come together at negotiating table, and they uh, open their heart out, and with the uh, good mediator, uh, they, who is able to extract what the truth is, and they would come to a proper resolution, which is suitable to both of them. The adversary, adversarial system may not work. That is what I wanted to add. Thank you, Judge. Uh, now let's hear the third side to this issue. Uh, Sri Ram, over to you. Yes, thank you, Gregory. You know, it's plain and simple. Uh, for, for what business needs, mediation ticks off all the boxes. Less cost, less time, keeps relationships, continues them, gives a practical solution, and there is no risk going to a mediator. You're always at risk going to a judge or an arbitrator, you may lose, but there is no risk. And there is a phrase that Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon has used before, which I like very much. When talking about mediation, he says, what's not to like about it? What's not to like about it? And I think it's a great selling you know, formula. The only doubt that Indian business used to have and any business elsewhere, uh, before was, how do I enforce this mediation agreement? And I think it's thanks to the wonderful work done by uh, the, the Singapore uh, team, um, George especially, I always hope, uh, say this, that I, I treat him as the father of the convention. He always says, no, don't single me out. Everybody is God, granted, lots of people. But George, there has to be a face to something, so you're the face. So you really, you know, cleared up that last segment of doubt in people's minds um, with the coming into force of the convention. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Ram. And I'll give the final word on this issue to the father, George. I'm a, actually, I'm a grandfather. A real grandfather. I have a four-month-old granddaughter. Okay. Um, let me give the fourth perspective, perhaps. So I've been a practicing lawyer for 40 years. And, and you know, we lawyers like to fight. You, your, you yourself know that, right? right. <laughs> um, but some cases have to be fought out. I agree. But the majority of cases can be resolved. And that's, that's been our experience. And you know, I, I alluded to this in my opening, my welcome address. SIMP has been working with uh, our partners in India, China, South Korea, and Japan for the past six years. And, and we've, we've now made very good uh, friends with, with senior partners in law firms. And some of them have actually invited, invited us to their sessions with their clients. And the, the, the constant refrain is this, from the business perspective, I think we should hear from Ayuri as well. Um, businesses are not interested in long drawn out issues. Maybe we lawyers are, we want to prove a point of law. Uh, but for them, if you can resolve it quickly, commercially, um, save them that time and that cost, all the better. And I think, I won't go back to what Chief Justice Manning said, said, you have to look at what the user wants. Yeah. Because we are all service providers. And as a lawyer, I'm, I'm, I think this is the, this has changed in Singapore, this is the culture now. I think lawyers also appreciate that we have to move with the times. We have to listen to what the clients want. And I think now the trend is for mediation to be used in a complementary fashion with litigation and arbitration. That is, that is, that these are facts, okay? And I think the sooner we get on board in that, from that perspective, the better. Serve, serve the time well. The time will stay with us. Thank you, George. You made reference to the user and you also mentioned Mayuri. Uh, so uh, Mayuri, the fifth side is yours on this issue before we move on. Yeah, so certainly, I mean, as I have said that we actually encourage to have the mediation or arbitration of a contract. And we have noticed that businesses are also welcoming this fact that, you know, mediations are helping. In uh, I would like to share another case. Very recently, we are in the process of mediation. 
and to our great surprise he, somehow the other party was not really very uh, cooperative in this uh, entire uh, scenario but the mediators have uh, proactively offered that you know with a view would you like to have some second round of mediation so that was really very uh, like you know happy surprise for us and we are now going through the second round of mediation so this kind of and of course my business team was uh, certainly willing because they really don't want to go into arbitration and further proceedings so we are now proceeding for the second round of mediation so that is really helping and my team is like pro for mediation for sure wonderful, wonderful. what a nice way to end that particular aspect now um, niti ayog ceo amitabh khan uh, spoke earlier about the formulation of a policy action plan for online dispute resolution or odr for short uh, could we hear from the panel members on your views on the emerging trend of pivoting on odr so i'd like to ask um, sriram first to share on this you know uh, sometimes the phrase virtual mediation is used when people talk about online mediation and i i i protest because i say online mediation virtual means you know almost as good but in my view online mediation is really an enhancer it makes mediation so much easier um if you're dealing with people from different cities and different countries if it's a complex problem i mean this is just the ideal way to go it's easier it saves time it saves people travel scheduling is so much easier and there's one thing you know the you find that the screen filters out animosity the people people get together on the screen and if they're not shouting at each other like they would would have done if they're all sitting in the same room they're able to think of things a little more calmly uh, so there is a kind of a comfort uh, there which 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 online mediation gives the results are much better success rates are, i think are better um, uh, with online you don't lose a mediation because you know time is running out and uh you know people people have to get back home to their country so on just like mediation is here to stay i think online mediation is here to stay um and sometimes i ask myself the question i said did it take covid 19 for us to realize that there is an online possibility of mediation we could have done it before but this is probably you know the single most benefit that covid 19 has brought about um that the fact that online suits mediation so well is possibly going to be the tipping factor into making mediation emerge as choice of dispute resolution reflexive action let's go to mediation we can sort this out so much quicker let's give it a try what do we lose so i think online is going to make a huge amount of difference thank you sri ram so let me be a little bit provocative you know because some some have said that the online dispute uh, modality um for example odr for mediation and so on could come at the price of losing out on the relational aspect or perhaps even some chemistry george you want to comment about this Okay, so I let me be honest. I prefer face-to-face -face mediation because I think you have the opportunity then as a mediator to connect better, uh, to read body language, uh, even to express emotions, and have that face-to-face -face encounter. So I'm a bit old school in that way, but I do recognize that you know um, online mediation works as well. In fact, we've been having a lot of online mediation at SIMC. and there are new techniques we learn as as mediators um so i i can just give some very brief examples i do if i have to do an online mediation i would do a small private session i would meet the party separately first to connect take a bit more time to connect with the party 
Um, one very quick technique I can share is if I see a party for the first time, sit alongside their lawyer. When they see you there with their lawyer sitting alongside, they feel more comforted. Not that you've taken sides, but I think they don't see you as totally divorced or alienated from the process. So there are there I'm sure you know we can have a session on that. But uh, it's here to stay. And I think for us as mediators, as parties, we can learn how to use technology the best way. That's it. It works. Thank you, George. Great, great tips and tricks there. And uh, I think uh, that investment of time makes brilliant sense. Uh, Judge, we're going to add something? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, actually, I think uh, it's a combination of both. Can't seem to hear you. Sorry, uh, you, you can't hear me? We can now. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So what I was trying to say was that, uh, look, COVID, as Shiram Panchu has rightly said, COVID times have driven us to this technology because it became necessity. As uh, physical hearings in the courts were not possible, physical hearings in arbitration was not possible, and likewise, physical mediation meetings were not possible. So to that extent, technology has come uh, to our aid. And the technology which was used earlier also across, uh, even including, uh, uh, we know in every court system, I, I know Singapore Supreme Court is one of the best courts in so far as use of technology is concerned. But COVID has, the technology has been transformed in that way, the, the, the uh, justice system has been transformed. ODR relates not only to mediation, but all these forms of uh, settlement disputes where technology is used today, courts in India, courts in Singapore, courts elsewhere are also in virtual mode. And uh, uh, as Justice Sundesh Menon also mentioned about one of the hearings of uh, uh, SICC, where uh, he headed the bench of five judges and I was from India, one another person was from England and three judges from Singapore and two parties from two different jurisdictions. So we could do that. That is possible in mediation also, which could not have been possible earlier. I if you give you one example where Justice Ramanna only a, a few months ago had sent me a um, dispute which was pending for quite some time in the Supreme Court and uh, for mediation. And it was a dispute between two law publishers, one international uh, uh, publication and other uh, Indian publisher, uh, legal journals, which are um, as uh, 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 George Nim also said for this, because of confidentiality, I'm not uh, stating the names, but two very, very reputed publishers, which was going on for quite some time. And the entire dispute, I, and it resulted in settlement, I could uh, settle it. And the entire proceedings were on mediation. Having said so, I also agree with George that there are some cases where face-to-face -face meeting bring better results. Of um, course, uh, it, it may be more uh, appropriate or more relevant when we come to family disputes. They may be business disputes or other disputes. When we come to matrimonial disputes, all these, uh, again, if I share another anecdote, and although it's a long one, but I'm not going to go into that, uh, the dispute was between the um, nephew and the uncle in relation to uh, the, uh, the, the uncle's brother or nephew's father, uh, uh, some uh, last rites after his death, the very peculiar kind of dispute which had arisen that who should um, immerse the uh, ashes in uh, the, as we do in, in uh, Hindus in uh, Ganges. Now that kind of dispute has not come earlier, may not come again. I was sitting as a judge in Delhi High Court and I decided that dispute in a one particular manner. But then the two were at loggerheads. They were not talking to each other. They went in appeal. In appeal, the matter was referred to a mediator and that mediator, she could settle that dispute. Now the dis difference is what I said in the judgment that was agreed by, in a way, that was a settlement which was agreed at. But what is the, I, I'm going to give two messages. Number one, this might not have been settled on uh, 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 I mean, on a virtual mode where the parties were not coming together. It could be settled only when they came uh, 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 together and were talking to each other. And uh, the second thing was it restored the relationship, which might not have been restored by 
um, adjudication process. That relationship was restored and it was really a moving, uh, which I was told by the mediator also, a moving scene where uh, uncle and nephew, they buried their all differences. They were hugging each, with each other and they decided, yeah, we'll go together and immerse the ashes together. Wonderful. So, that, so therefore, I, I think it's it's maybe a mix of technology as well as wherever possible, the uh, in a physical mode, we have to go ahead with that. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Wonderful, Wonderful anecdotes, anecdotes and wise, wise words indeed. Words. Now, now um, we know also that mediation helps the courts and improves access to justice. justice. Chief Justice Ramana spoke about reducing areas and backlogs in the judicial system, as well as what he described as the phenomenon of luxurious litigation. Chief Justice Menon also mentioned that one reason for Singapore's revival of mediation was to relieve judicial caseload. Now, how do you think mediation could be one of the solutions to address such issues in India? Um, if I could ask um, Justice Sikri as well as uh, Sri Ram to speak to this um, succinctly, uh, time is catching up with us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I, I try to do, uh, uh, speak as, uh, I mean, in as less words as possible. Number one, which was said uh, by both the Chief Justices, uh, access to justice. Uh, where the adjudication process is very time consuming and very costly also. And in a country like India, where uh, I mean, many people cannot afford to go. And even in Singapore, where the fee of, and it's an international phenomena, where the fee of lawyers, etc., is uh, now quite high nowadays. Now, the question is what is the access to justice? We have read many jurisprudential theories in our, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, in law as to what the justice is. But in the context of mediation, if I may say so, and this is what uh, I have read, uh, written in one articles also almost 12, 13 years ago, and I quoted Professor Spellberg, Love, Heyman, and Menkad Mido. They say the best form of deciding the dispute is self-determination. And therefore, this self-determination is the process which is only available in mediation, where the parties come together and mediator is a facilitator, and they decide what is good for them. And of course, uh, uh, the mediators like Shiram Panchu and George Lim, they help them, but then they uh, come together and decide what is good for them. And this self-determination is the, if we talk in terms of fairness also, I think the, it becomes the uh, most fair system of resolution of disputes. And it leads to um, the future collaborations as well as uh, Lynn had said earlier. So therefore, access to justice, uh, if we compare it with the arbitration and mediation, it may, be, uh, it, it may uh, have an upper hand in that sense. Now, second thing which we have already said, and I will not repeat much, that less time consuming, less costly when the things can be settled and under COVID conditions. And when the, uh, the, the Indian courts, as the Justice Ramanna, Chief Justice Ramanna said, we have today the nearly 45 million cases. During COVID only, the backlog has gone by almost eight to 10 million. So therefore in a situation like this, we have to have other channels and mediation becomes a very, very important channel uh, for uh, diverting the cases from the court system to uh, 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 this. And, and in uh, India in 2002, we had inserted section 89, court and ex-mediation, and where again, Chief Justice Amanna gave the statistics, 3.2 million cases referred and one more than a little more than 1 million cases settled also. So therefore, if uh, we, uh, uh, and now we are thinking about the pre-litigation mediation as well. And if all this is put together, Yes, uh, it was said by Chief, uh, this uh, Minister uh, Tong that we are thinking about the Mediation Act and uh, Singapore Convention. We would like to have the experience of uh, Singapore in this and uh, because India is at the almost final stages of uh, drafting of the Mediation Act. So therefore, uh, mediation can play a very, very significant role in lessening the burden of the courts. Thank you so much, Judge. Um, Sri Ram? Um, you know, there are two things here. One is access to justice and the other is the, uh, the areas in our courts. 
Um, it's interesting, access to justice, we always think that, you know, it is a third party who can give you justice, a judge or an arbitrator, and you have to go there. But really, when you look at it, when the parties in dispute themselves arrive at something which they think is fair, reasonable and acceptable, isn't that justice? And I think, in fact, it could well be a higher form of justice. Because this is how the parties themselves see it. Any other way will mean, you know, one party thinks I've got justice and the other party thinks I haven't got justice. I'll go and appeal. So I think mediation is a pretty strong, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 tool for securing justice. Now, if mediation is employed well, and for that, I think the primary requirement is a large body of trained, experienced mediators, professional mediators, you know, who make a career out of it, for whom it's a profession. I think that is important. Um, we, we, while we do have four annex centers where we, a pro bono case is conducted, um, we cannot just stop with that. Uh, we have to encourage uh, mediation to become a profession. Then you will have the numbers ready to tackle the areas. And then we can tell uh, parties, look, go and try mediation first. Why you come to court without trying mediation? Uh, Pre-litigation mediation is now being thought of in India. In fact, we had some, we had an amendment about three years back. And I think in the forthcoming act, uh, I had the privilege of being one of the committee to, 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 to draft it. Pre-litigation, I think, is going, to be, uh, is going to be a strong factor. And I think that is going to provide a lot of cases being sent to mediation. Wonderful. If we say that before you come to court, you must make an attempt to mediate. The numbers of cases that will come to mediation is going to be large. But we need to have this large body of, you know, professional mediators. That is an absolute, you know, requirement. Um, and I think our success or lack of success will depend on that. Uh, if you get in so many people and they're seen as doing a good job, then you will have cases, you know, flowing to mediation tables away from courtrooms. And that will give the court uh, the, the ability to deal with cases which really should be dealt with only by a judge. And we don't have to delay those cases for dozens of years uh, just because they, you know, they're, they're mixed up with so many others. So it works across the board. Thank you, Sri Ram. Can I say something to you? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So mediation was formally introduced in Singapore in 1994 in the courts. And in the beginning, I think when we started, the clearing of cases was one of the uh, motivations. But, you know, 27 years later, I, I can say now that there is, there's been a cultural change. I mean, the courts encourage mediation, and that was very important. The practice directions now to encourage mediation. Uh, but now I think the lawyers who initially might have been resistant, we now consider ourselves, we now consider mediation to be part of the dispute resolution process. It's part and parcel. Um, and I want to attribute this actually to the judiciary, the government, and private sector working together. Um, Ministry of Law, I think we played a very important role in supporting mediation. Um, and I think that has worked well in Singapore. So we're not just talking about, now we have more backlog really of cases in the courts, but it's now a cultural change. And I, for me, I, 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 that's very important because it's about how we as human beings Want to manage our dispute, and people now realize that yeah, mediation should, should be the first port of call before attempting the adversarial processes. And and that if we can cultivate that amongst um, our society, I think it will hold us in, in very good shape. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether Wayne want to weigh in on this. And that's a good segue uh, because I think in Singapore, I understand a number of key pieces have been put together by the government, and perhaps Wayne, you could share on that briefly. Thank you, Greg. Um, it's certainly not something that the government can sort of just put together alone, but indeed, as, as George said, 
it's about the government, um, about the private sector, about judiciary coming together uh, to support this. Um, I thought I'd just share a little bit about the story of how mediation, international mediation, took off in Singapore. Um, just to set the backdrop to, to showcase how this partnership and ecosystem approach really works. Um, I think in uh, Chief Justice Menon's speech, he referenced 2013, a year when himself, as well as the Minister for Law, constituted a working group on international commercial mediation, which George, the grandfather, co-chaired. Um, and I think from there, the working group, which was a collaborative approach across uh, professional mediators and lawyers, um, academics and so on, um, came together and put forth a set of recommendations on what would be some of the key ingredients of this ecosystem. And from then, there were three really key developments over three milestones, so 2014, 2017, and 2019. In 2014, it was really about um, seeding that foundation of the ecosystem. Uh, two institutions were formed. That was when the Singapore International Mediation Center uh, was established. And, and it, it was really, really there, there to promote and hear the, the provision of uh, international commercial mediation services. Best, best in class, class uh, uh, institution. institution. And, the and the case load is growing. growing. I think um, many people, people have remarked how it has matured as an institution. Right. And with, with that, that also the acceptability and the uh, uh, popularity, popularity, I think, of uh, mediation, mediation. Um, um, whether standalone or as part of the ARPNET ARP process. Uh, the same year also, the Singapore International Mediation Institute, or CIMI, which is a professional standards body that credentials and provides uh, quality assurance for professional mediators in Singapore. So th those were really two key institutions in the ecosystem. Three years later, in 2017, that's when uh, government then looked at legislation in the form of Singapore Mediation Act. Uh, this was really to uh, put in place a series of provisions to back up mediation. And I think this is very important to stakeholders. So both in terms of upholding uh, uh, mediated settlements um, so that there was some enforceability, other provisions also uh, like enabling parties to apply to the court to put a stay on court proceedings while mediation outcomes uh, were pending, uh, as well as to protect the confidentiality of uh, mediated settlements. So that was the key piece. And along the way through, through the years, the judiciary was an immensely supportive stakeholder, a strongly encouraging mediation uh, in the courts. So that was the second key development. Then in 2019, was the Singapore Convention on Mediation. And I think that's when the international dimension came about. This idea of promoting enforceability in an international uh, arena across borders, um, that, that was really key. And that is um, really a milestone in terms of uh, taking us toward a vision of something like the New York Convention and what it does for arbitration. And after that, Singapore actually updated our legislative framework again to give backing to the Singapore. So today, I think where the government and the Ministry of Law stands, we continue to work really closely with SIMC. We continue to work really closely with other stakeholders to really promote mediation with business chambers and so on. So I think this is really that ecosystem approach that we try to bring about. Thank, thank you, Waylon, and thank you also for weighing in on this aspect of, you know, the uh, Singapore uh, Convention as well, uh, which was, um, you know, a point that um, I'm glad uh, we were able to touch on. Uh, now, it's time for Q&As with the limited time that we have, and it's much food for thought, actually, based on the rich wisdom we've heard from our distinguished panel. But here's the first question uh, that comes to us. Um, to Mayuri's comments on the use of mediation, a participant has commented that GCs and corporate executives lack confidence in attempting mediation. Why is that? What would be the roadmap to change this attitude? And so fittingly, I will ask Mayuri uh, to respond to this and, and the others can weigh in later. Yeah, as, uh, as I have said that, you know, the time has changed and people have changed the attitude towards this. Like my personal experience with mediation is certainly different. What I would rather insist is like, you know, from the beginning, you should make sure that your contracts are properly drafted because what we have noticed is the particular clauses are not drafted well. And then people waste time and the companies are wasting time on 
getting the right interpretation of the clause that has been put into the contract right so if you have a proper clause in a contract and if you get a right panel entanglement because earlier what used to happen we used to have ad hoc kind of clauses in a uh, contract and not to like you know stick to a particular institution per se right so if we really mention clearly about which institution to have the uh, you know arbitration conducted or mediation conducted so if we have clarity about the process that you really intend to do that then i'm sure the response from the mediators and you know the touch for the you know actually going for the process will be faster and that is where we as an uh, gc should work towards and that will suddenly bring because now the impanel uh, mediation mediators and arbitrators are really you know fill the i mean they are uh, high in their knowledge and they are they, they carry the expertise that is required for such kind of thing so i believe that if you really look towards and uh, contact them uh, the right forum then there will not be there should not be any issue with the mediation process that you will forecast thank you so thank much, you much mayuri quick, quick contribution yes please, please. Okay, okay so, so i'm talking about cross border dispute um, um, i understand that a lot of indian businesses now use siac clauses um for arbitration and, and that's good because i i think india is like the top user in siac or one yeah. of the top users right so um i think mayuri your, your suggestion about having a, a tiered clause is really good and if parties businesses want to consider mediation consider the art meda protocol that we have with yes. we work very closely with the siac it's a one stop process you get the benefit of both arbitration and mediation yeah. thank, thank, you. thank you thank you george good points there about tier dispute resolution clauses the case for standard boilerplate or template clauses and mayuri thank you for speaking to that issue second question now some participants have asked about what other stakeholders need to do one stakeholder group is lawyers it seems that a lot of senior lawyers are very reluctant to propose mediation to their clients how do we address the issue of too much uh, lip service in one of the phrases used being paid for mediation and this dovetails with i think a perception by some that adr means alarming drop in revenue and affects the livelihoods of litigators so let's be you know transparent in addressing this issue Uh, I'll, I'll open, open it, up it up to the, the panel. panel. Yeah, can I come in on this? Yes, yes please, Sri Ram. <laughs> See, I think mediation is going to be driven on one side by the judiciary, which says, "I don't come here unless we've mediated." Mm-hmm. On the other side, by users, by the chief executive, you know. Uh, asking his legal department why are we not trying mediation it's at these two ends you know that the the push is going to come um and as far as lawyers uh, you know it's a mixed scene you will see the number of lawyers who sign up to become mediators i mean when we started in 2005 i was very worried you know how will the lawyers take it the first round we could with difficulty rope in you know 35 lawyers to be trained but every other round of training of 35 sees more than 200 applications so somewhere the bar in india has you know taken this to become mediators also to come with parties to the mediation sessions um So I, I frankly think that the lawyer resistance for is a little more, I mean, a little less than what we, you know, uh, built it up to be. Um, but let's address the elephant in the room. The feeling that if a case which I have a big case goes to mediation, I'm not going to get a fee out of this. And I think we should develop this concept of a mediation fee. that if the case settles where well in mediation the lawyer will get a reasonable percentage of you know whatever it would cost to take it to trial we can work out the mechanisms um we know that as mediators we must look at you know incentives so my point is incentivize the lawyer uh work out a system of a reasonable fee the client is happy to pay it because he's getting a mediation result the lawyer is happy to do his work 
So workout is a system of a, a mediation fee. Ultimately, you know, if the client is a happy client, if what the lawyer has done for him in a mediation, a happy client spreads the word and the happy client stays with you. So I think this is what, how we need to, uh, you know, to speak to the lawyer community. And I'm, I'm encouraged by one factor now, is that law firms are realizing that they need to have a mediation capacity. And that if they don't have that, that might just be that one minus point in the portfolio mm -hmm. to prevent the client from availing of those services. So I think if, you know, in the near future, almost every law firm is going to create a mediation capacity. It's Thank a question you. of time, you know, we barely started mediation in 2005. And if you see how far it's traversed in this country, through all the uh, courts, the district court, the Supreme Court, and the, the amount of interest there is in this, it's a question of time. But I agree, we should pay attention and see how lawyers can be incentivized. Yeah, and if I may only add to that, what uh, uh, Shiram has said, and rather summarize that, it is the awareness which is very necessary that uh, we have to tell them what are, and, and today's summit, which you have organized and then compliment uh, uh, you for that. This is one of the event which is creating awareness among all those who are participating. So the mindset uh, would change. Today, what is per the perception is, if the case goes to mediation, as if, as an advocate, I am glued to the litigation and it is only litigation which is giving me fee. And once it go to mediation, I am out of pocket. But that is not so. Rather, what, what has to be told is mediation in for lawyers is another dimension of their practice yeah. from which they will earn. And as uh, uh, Shiram has said that they can be incent uh, incentivized also. But apart from that, uh, the, the, uh, uh, merely by going to mediation and uh, your, your case has not gone from you and a satisfied customer or satisfied client will bring back 10 cases to you and it uh, will spread the word. So this is the message which is to be taken to them and which is to be told to them that it is not uh, uh, taking away uh, work from you but rather adding another dimension of work for you, it is, that is mediation practice. So you are, adv advocacy is also there, mediation practice is also there. Insightful point, Judge, not a minus, but a plus. Uh, yes. Time is catching up on us, and I'm only um, able to ask a final question, and, um, and then we will wrap this up and invite all the panelists to just give us 30 seconds of closing remarks before I, I close proceedings. A participant has asked how the government of India can itself be onboarded to resolve disputes by mediation. Waylin, could you share how the Singapore government uses mediation for its disputes? Uh, thank you. Uh, just a quick one. Um, indeed, I think the public sector can play a role in leading the way uh, forward. So in Singapore, for, for the government, um, of course, we have all kinds of contracts. And for the various contracts, there's usually some kind of a standard form of contract. So over time, we have always uh, tried to build in uh, many of these uh, mention of uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, and among them would be mediation. Um, so that, that places the tool uh, in front of uh, um, agencies uh, within the government. And then when a dispute arises, then they, they can make a choice depending on what the circumstances and the case uh, uh, entails. Thank you, Waylin. Um, and so um, we have been really you know, privileged this morning to hear rich perspectives from our panel members. And um, we now want to invite each of them, our esteemed members of the panel, to share their closing remarks. And uh, I would ask you to just spend about 30 seconds at most with your concluding thoughts on mediation. Uh, and I'll first ask Mayuri. Yeah, hi, thank you, agree. See, I simply feel that you have to convince yourself first. Then convincing the management is very easy because in any case, the mediation is cost saving. So there are question which I saw that, you know, CFO is not ready. So finally, if you are convinced that mediation will help you, it will certainly help the company. 
so you go with that attitude and i'm sure you will be able to convince the management because finally it is for the gcs to really drive it from the company's point of view thank you thank you mayuri uh william thank you um I think a key part of building this ecosystem, I think, is clearly about developing the culture amongst businesses, professionals, and capability building. So I think on that note, I just wanted to make mention that there is a Singapore Convention Week uh, in early September from 6 to 10 in the Ansu Choi Academy as well. There's an opportunity to learn a lot more, hear a lot more sharing about mediation, uh, be seminars and workshops, and I think you can find it online, and, and please come and attend. Thank you. Great. Uh, capability, uh, capability building, building to add on to add the, to the, the points, points that William made earlier about ecosystem, ecosystem as well. So, so I now I invite, invite um, uh, uh, Justice, Justice uh, Sikri. Sikri. Yeah, I would only say to sum up what the mediation is and what are the ethos. You see, uh, discussions are always better than arguments because an argument is to find out who is right, but a discussion in the form of mediation is to find out what is right. So we reach the right conclusions. In the process, we or this mediation heals the past, live the present, and dream the future. And I read one uh, on this uh, chat, somebody had written, and I want to quote that, mediation is medication for healing disputants. Thank you. Deeply profound. I think we need to reflect on those words. Thank you, Judge. Um, Sri Ram. Would you like to go next, please? Sriram, you're You're a bit soft, Sriram. I think we should think about collaborative efforts between India, um, whether it's in training, certification, handling of disputes, domestic, cross-border, and providing, you know, uh, uh, services to the region in this part of the world. Uh, Singapore has come a very long way in mediation. We have traversed quite a distance. And I think if we work together, uh, we can do a lot. The Chief Justice recently talked about a Hyderabad center uh, to, for arbitration. And maybe that can become the fulcrum of our joint efforts. Um, but clearly mediation is here to stay. As Omar Khayyam said, the moving finger has reached and moves on. It can't be taken back. It's here to stay. And I would say that, again, taking from Nirad Chaudhary's book about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, I think there are four beneficial horsemen who will avert the apocalypse. And that is the Singapore Convention, online mediation, the concept of pre-litigation mediation and mediation becoming a profession. These, I think, are the four horsemen who will avert the apocalypse. Thank you. Memorable anecdote there. Thank you so much, uh, Sri Ram. And uh, for the final words from our grandfather and father of mediation, George. <laughs> okay, very quickly. I like the fact that today we talked about um, Government, government, judiciary, judiciary and, and private, private sector working together, together to promote mediation. Um, Sri Ram, we've had this conversation. I think my wish for India is that India will ratify the Singapore Convention on Mediation very quickly. Because you already you already ratified the New York Convention. You've, you've got the processes in place. This is not difficult. It's giving businesses another option. So, so for me, that would be very good for mediation in India. Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, just to underscore the powerful case for collaboration that Sri Ram mentioned, that was also referred to extensively by Minister Tong and the Chief Justices. And so on that note, it remains for me to thank our distinguished panel members for their thought leadership, building on the key themes from Chief Justice Ramana, Chief Justice Menon, and the legal luminaries who spoke earlier. I shall now pass the time back to Wee Ming. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg, and our panelists for an illuminating discussion. I think we can safely say that mediation future shines very bright. I'd like to call upon our strategic partner, Ms. Rumani Menon, mediator and director, CAM Arbitration and Mediation Practice, and Mr. Mahanosh Tapuji, co-founder and director, Mediation Mantra, to deliver the closing remarks. 
Rukmani and Murnosh, please. Thank you, Women. It is indeed unfortunate that we are not all gathered in a lovely conference room, ready to head out for a meal as the summit concludes. Better days will on, dawn on us soon, but for now, I'm addressing you live from our camp offices in Bangalore, India. On behalf of camp arbitration and mediation practice, it is my pleasure to present a few concluding remarks and convey my gratitude to everyone involved in hosting and participating at the India-Singapore Mediation Summit 2021. As early entrants in the field of mediation, camp has been privileged to witness India's mediation journey Today, we heard from the highest voices in India and Singapore, our esteemed Chief Justices, speak to the value and significance of mediation in dispute resolution. What a journey it has been. A few words of gratitude are in order, and I'll start with our partners in mediation. To everyone at the Singapore International Mediation Center for investing deeply in India's mediation journey, it has been a pleasure to conceptualize and bring to life this spectacular event. To our collaborators in Delhi, Mediation Mantras, we cherish the brainstorming and strategizing sessions with you over the last few months. Our gratitude to the Second Minister of Law, Singapore, Honorable Mr. Edwin Tong, for obliging us with your time and presenting us with your words of wisdom and motivation. Today has been a day of unprecedented learning and joyful listening. To hear from Honorable Chief Justice Ramana, Chief Justice of India, and Honorable Justice Menon, the Chief Justice of Singapore. Honorable judges, your words are now set in stone and will go a long way in driving the legal fraternity and business community to adopt mediation as the first option for resolving disputes of all types. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for your words of encouragement as always. You have been a true ambassador of ODR in India. Thank you to the panelists, Justice Sikri, Mr. Sriram Panchu, Mr. George Lim, Ms. Mayuri, Ms. Leland, the moderator, Mr. Gregory Vijendran for the stimulating discussions about the growing popularity of mediation for resolving disputes and its benefits uh, about uh, very beneficial words about uh, uh, regarding spreading awareness of mediation as to, and I loved uh, Ms. Uh, Sri Ram Panchu's words that mediation has to soon become an earning profession in India so that it gets a lot of encouragement. To all our judges who have made time to join us today, thank you. As we have experienced, particularly over the last year, your support and guidance of a case to mediation is a game changer. We ask for your active support through strong reference to make mediation mainstream in India. At camp, a me private mediation center, we have successfully mediated in the last one year, complex commercial cases referred by courts as the value of institutional mediation has been truly recognized. Also, I would like to add over here that we encourage corporates to put in mediation clauses what was being referred to by Ms. Mayuri during her discussion. Thank you to the media for your constant support. There's been, there's so much planned post-summit, especially the launch of the CAMP SIMC COVID-19 joint protocol for commercial mediation, which has been referred to by Honorable Minister Tong. We trust the media that you will continue to join us on this journey of advocating collaborative dispute resolution. A big thank you to all friends of CAMP in India, Singapore, and all parts of the world for your constant support. Signing off from our CAMP offices in Bangalore. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.
Thank you, Rukmani. Uh, thank you, Weeming. Good afternoon and namaste, everybody. I'd like to begin by, like Rukmani, thanking everybody who has spoken today. The Honorable Chief Justice of India, Justice Ramana. The Honorable Chief Justice of Singapore, Justice Sundaresh Menon. Our special guests, Mr. Edwin Tong SC, Mr. Amitabh Kant. Our panelists, Justice Sikri, Mr. Sriram Panchu, Ms. Mayuri Khatu, Ms. Lai Win, uh, and George Lim, and Mr. Gregory Lim, uh, Gregory Vijayendran. Thank you for all the wisdom that you shared with us today and the generosity with which you shared anecdotes and ideas. Having heard all that we have said today, I ask myself a very simple question. What did the Singapore India Mediation Summit teach me today? What is the value of this new information that I received? And what are my key takeaways for today? It will come as a surprise to most of you that I am not a lawyer turned mediator. I'm actually a corporate executive turned mediator. Having spent 30 years in the corporate world, working with multinational firms and uh, dealing with large multi-stakeholder projects, I look at things and I absorb information through a business and socio-economic lens, and which is what I was doing today. As a person dealing with business disputes every day, I ask myself, how is mediation different from other forms of ADR? What's in it for me? And what do I need to do next? The answer to the first question, how is mediation different, has been detailed throughout the morning today. Mediation is perhaps the most empowering form of dispute resolution available to us. Mediations are facilitated by skilled mediators, but the mediated solutions are curated by parties themselves. So the solutions are more sustainable. What's in it for you? Well, the availability of mediation is a key element in the ease of doing business. As the Chief Justices, both of them in the morning said, conflicts and disputes are unavoidable. So the question isn't, how do you avoid mediation? How do you avoid conflicts? The question is, how do you manage them? Litigation puts you through a lot of financial and emotional stress before it can give you relief. Mediation is more immediate and less painful. There is no third party judgment and there are no losers in a mediation. In a good mediation, business interests are preserved, brand reputations are protected, and business relationships are strengthened. That brings me to the last question. What do we need to do next? Let us look at ISMS 2021 as a solid bridge between the old and the new ways of dispute resolution, and an opportunity to reach out to all of us. Let us begin a deeper, more meaningful conversations on the issues at hand. Let us as businesses, lawyers, judges, and mediators understand how we can work together and help each other resolve disputes before they get out of hand. Consider, as Mr. Pancho said, pre-litigation mediation as your first port of call. We can connect you to an increasing number of professional private trained mediators that understand the complex issues and the stakes involved in commercial disputes. Depending on what your conflict is, there will be more than one good mediator who can mediate solutions for you. There are organizations like Samadhan and Madhyam in Delhi, AMP in Mumbai, CAMP in Bangalore, FCDR in Chennai, IIAM in Kochi, and the list goes on. There are organizations providing mediation services all over the country. Then there are some great mediators that transcend location and category, like Mr. Sri Rampanchu, Mr. Amarjit Singh Chandyok, Ms. Laila Olapalli, Ms. Sheila Balsari, Mr. Sudhanshu Batra, Ms. Sadhana Ramachandran, Mr. J.P. Singh, Mr. A.J. Jawad, Mr. J.L.N. Murthy, Ms. Uma Ramanathan, Ms. Tanu Chandra, Ms. Chitra Narayanan, Ms. George Merlopalat. Mr. Prathmesh Popat. These are just people I have met in the last couple of years and had deep engagements with. 
and there are so many more great mediators in this country today. And SIMC, led by George Lim and Wee Meng, can connect you to some of the best mediators from around the world. But not everybody is a George Lim or a Sri Ram Panchu. So we recognize that we have to build professional capacity to scale with rigorous training programs and refresher programs and setting the quality standards and checks for mediators and mediations in India. So when you place your trust in a mediation, your trust is not misplaced. So what does the future of mediation look like? We have more than 40,000 mediation, court annex mediation centers in India today, and about 150,000 trained certified mediators across the country. And they are all nurtured by the judiciary as led by our Supreme Court Chief Justice. You will also be happy to know that large corporate law firms are investing time and money today to understand how they can use mediation to best serve business interests. Mediation Mantras is also working with one of the largest law firms to develop a deep understanding of mediation and how it can help their clients resolve disputes constructively. This mediation advocacy program is being developed with SIMC and we'll be making an announcement about it very soon. What we need is to engage one another deeply and start building circles of trust, a robust ecosystem of alternate dispute resolution mechanisms that work together for the benefit of all. I hope this ISMS 2021, with this enthusiastic participation from all the stakeholders in dispute resolution, will instill confidence in the judiciary, in the legal community, the business community, and among existing and potential litigants, that mediation is a great option. It can be start of the mission mode for a lot of us. It is the common ground that will enhance the ease of doing business. And as the Honorable Chief Justice N.V. Ramana said in the morning, mediation, if done well, can truly help facilitate the access to justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Rukmani and Manoj, our partners in India and our friends. I'd like to thank all of our distinguished speakers and panelists for joining us in the inaugural India-Singapore Mediation Summit. Again, I'd like to thank Niti Ayuk for coming on board as our partner and to all our event partners in India, in Singapore, who extended their generous support to make this summit a reality. A big thank you to all of our participants for expressing your great enthusiasm and for joining us today. Till we meet again, take care and stay tuned for more updates on mediation. Thank you.